now going to invite Bill Ball, one of the members of our reunion planning committee to welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Bill Ball. I'm a 1970 chemical engineering alumnus. For the past two years, I've been working with a group of fellow alumni from the classes of 1970 and 71 to assist with planning our reunion. For the class of 1970, we were ready to celebrate the reunion when the pandemic changed our plans. While the path hasn't been quite what we expected, I'm delighted to be here with all of you today, and I hope we can gather next year on campus in person. I'd like to read the names of the other host committee members. Donovan Bacalar, Physics 1970 um, and 77. Ken Hofton, the uh, chemistry in 71, Dave Holger, aerospace engineering, 1970, um, master's in 71 and a PhD in 74, Kent Larson, mechanical engineering in 71 and a JD in 75, we were in the same class there, Tom McAvoy, mechanical engineering, 1971 and uh, 1976 masters, John Myers, electrical engineering, 1970 and the MBA in 72, Steve Saffet, electrical engineering in 71 and computer and information sciences PhD in 1992. And Jeff Schott, chemical engineering in 70, 74 MS and a 1978 PhD. And Jeff is a, continues as a member of the faculty at the chemical engineering department today. On behalf of the committee, I hope that you enjoy the reunion program and congratulations to all of you in the classes of 1970 and 71 as we celebrate this milestone. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Maz Kave. Maz served as Dean uh, of the College of Science and Engineering since 2018 and has held various roles in the college for more than 45 years. Before serving as Dean, he served as Associate Dean for Research and Planning. Prior to that, he was head of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering from 1990 to 2005. Dean Caves joined the electrical and computer engineering faculty in 1975. And he's been a huge asset to the college and the university ever since. Dean Cave, I am reminded to tell you to go ahead and unmute yourself and take it from here. We are in your hands. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. And go Gophers. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you to all the members of the um, the planning committee for this uh, very, very special event. Welcome everyone and thank you for gathering with us today to celebrate the Golden Medallion Society and its newest members from the classes of 1970 and 1971. Today, we celebrate our community, our connections and our experiences. Over the past year, we have adapted and evolved as a community. And at the same, the, and the same is true, of course, for the events. While we had hoped, as has already been mentioned, for us to be together on campus for celebrating this reunion, we remain committed to celebrating our collective milestones and, and connections within the CSC community however we can. In fact, we are taking advantage of the technologies developed perhaps by a number of you in this audience. Reunion is a time of reflection. And as you have thought about your time in the Institute of Technology before College of Science and Engineering currently, I hope that you are proud of all that you have accomplished since graduation. I can tell you that the one thing that I repeat every time I have an opportunity to, to do so is to highlight the fact that the greatest points of pride and accomplishment for us as faculty in the College of Science and Engineering is the accomplishments and contributions of our alumni. So thank you, thank you for everything you have done and continue to do. While the past year has presented many challenges, it has also been a time of resilience, creativity and connections within our college under of course the leadership of uh, President Joan Gable. 
so much has happened and we've shared some of these with you in, in other occasions, but let me just highlight a few uh, items from this past year, very, very unusual past year. As you can imagine, the biggest accomplishments have involved really an almost instant change in the way we operated within the college, within the university, and how we delivered the instruction that we did to our students and of course carried out our research. But we've done that. Our faculty, staff, and students have been extremely resilient, creative, and done amazing things during these uh, unusual circumstances. Not only did we change the way we taught, and in fact, even conducted some of our laboratories, creating on the fly experiments that, that could be done at home by some of our students, for example. We also, our faculty, students, and staff contributed immensely to the immediate needs of combating the challenges of COVID-19. Some of the examples that have gotten a lot of attention include the creation, design and creation of a very low cost and publicly available, the design publicly available ventilator that has been uh, repeated, manufactured, used uh, not only within the United States, but, but also around the world. We also are very proud of uh, the con continued accomplishments of our faculty and students in their research. Uh, just this past year, while we were in this um, remote operation and everything, we landed one of four new engineering research centers from the National Science Foundation. This is an enormous accomplishment by our faculty who, who worked very hard in together with some, of, some other uh, colleagues from several other universities to have this distinction of bringing such an important area of research <clears throat> within, in, in, um, to, within the, uh, with the leadership of our college to the University of Minnesota. So a lot has continued to happen. And um, the, the key thing is, as I have mentioned already, is the resilience and creativity are, of our faculty and staff and their sense of justice. Because as you all know, we've also faced many issues related to social justice and our faculty, students and um, staff have been engaged. Uh, Moss, it looks like you've muted yourself accidentally. Done. There you go. I can hear you now. Yeah, I haven't touched anything. So sorry about that. When I only did lost you for maybe the last five seconds. Okay. Well, let me continue. So once again, um, I, I was highlighting certainly the, some of the examples of of uh, what our faculty, students, and staff have done during this past year. And of course, we could do the same for, for your accomplishments. Um, that, so, so thank you very much. Thank you for attending today. Congratulations to the classes of 1970 and 1971 as you mark your 50th reunion. Congratulations again to all the members of the Golden Medallion Society. We are so proud of our alumni community and I personally thank you for your continued support of the College of Science and Engineering. Now I've talked in the past about how the college has been nimble and ready over the past year, committed to our mission and to help the students. Faculty, of course, were at the forefront of this commitment, changing courses, laboratories, and everything else that I've already referred to. Today, we will hear from one of our faculty members, Professor Brenda Ogle. So let me say a few words introducing my colleague, Brenda Ogle. Professor Brenda Ogle has served as the head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering since 2019. 
and she joined the biomedical engineering faculty in 2013. Prior to that, Brenda held faculty positions at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and at the Mayo Clinic. Professor Ogle currently also serves as the director of the university's stem cell institute. Brenda's research is in the areas of cardiac tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. In particular, she works to understand the mechanisms to, for stem cell differentiation guided by extracellular matrix proteins, to develop tools for analysis of stem cell behavior, and to deliver therapeutics to tissue using engineering principles. She is a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and has served as on the board of directors of the Biomedical Engineering Society. And her recognitions include the 2016 Mullen Specter Truax Women's Leadership Award. We're extremely pleased that Brenda could join us and share some of her research with, with, with us. Brenda, please. Thank you, Dean Cave. It's really a pleasure to be here with you, to share some time with you. Let me get my screen up, make sure everyone can see. Great, hopefully that's clear. So as you heard from Dean Cave, I am incredibly passionate and interested and invested in how uh, engineering principles, innovations, and technologies can advance healthcare. And I know that when you were here as trainees, uh, that option and, and training opportunity in biomedical engineering did exist mostly in the form of um, degree minors. And then, uh, but I have no doubt that many of you have perhaps ended up in this space as, in, as part of your careers even so. And then right after you left in 1972, which happens to be the year I was born, the first uh, formal graduate program um, was put into place for biomedical engineering. And then in 2000, that was the year that the biomedical engineering department was formed. And actually that was the year that I received my PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Minnesota. And I was the first awardee from the department. So. I am deeply connected and committed to this department. And so it's really my honor to be leading the department right now. And what I'd love to do today is for us to, um, and my goal is really to share with you some of the transformative work going on, not just in our department, but in collaboration with many others um, across the university and across the nation. Um, and I'm hoping it'll pique your interest. Um, perhaps you've worked in this space. Perhaps you have actually suffered from some of the healthcare conditions that I'm going to talk about, or you know others who have. Um, and so with that, I will start and just show you our building. Um, if you haven't been on campus lately, um, this is uh, Mills Hasselmo Hall. It's located just to the east of Kaufman Union. And our goal inside this building is to conduct pioneering high impact research as all departments that you came from. We're trying to do in addition to educating the next generation of trailblazers who are gonna define this field going forward. We also wanna foster an inclusive community that supports the growth and learning of all of our members. And last but certainly not least, we really wanna accelerate and augment our impact because we're unique at Minnesota we actually have close connectivity to the medical school and clinics, you know, just through the tunnels. Uh, and then also the adjacent biomedical uh, industry. And so we've been trying to capitalize and I think we've recently been doing a tremendous job um, capitalizing on that connectivity. And it's come in the form of translational um, outcomes. And by translational, I mean, we either licensing technologies to companies for commercial use, or we've started clinical trials, or we've started our own um, startup companies based on the technology that's emerging from our labs. And so this graphic just shows you some of the, I would say boom in recent years of activity. Um, and this is specifically new startup companies. And so what I'd like to do is just 
share with you what uh, technologies are included in just a couple of these companies, and then tie that into where we think the field is going, and it, most importantly, where healthcare is going in the future and how um, the university is part of that and defining that. So the first company is called Second Wave Systems and it's Minneapolis based when it's the chief scientific officer is Hubert Lim, who's one of our faculty. And this device is meant to regulate inflammation in the body. And it does so by using ultrasound to stimulate the spleen. And they've actually developed a wearable device and their first application was gonna be, um, or it has been to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And actually they are selling this product um, and it's gone through clinical trials in that space. But then with COVID, they actually pivoted and they said, I think this actually could be valuable for um, those very severe cases of COVID. And they're actually now running a clinical trial here at the University of Minnesota uh, to utilize this therapy. And in the future, they want to be able to couple it with um, response systems that can adjust or tune the stimulation for the desired outcome. Hubert also has another company called Neuromod Devices, and this is based in Dublin, Ireland. And the condition that this technology is meant to treat is tinnitus. And they've been treating it by combining both um, sound stimulation with electrical tongue stimulation. And they just published one of the largest tinnitus clinical trials on 326 patients. It was published in Science Translational Medicine, and um, they have already received approval in Europe um, and are receiving approvals um, in the US uh, soon. You might be noticing a theme. A theme here is stimulation and then um, responsive stimulation that can actually adjust to a patient's needs. So the next example of this is the company Fascicle, which the founder and executive director is Zhi Yang from our faculty. And this um, is also a neurostimulation device, but it includes embedded sensors in the fascicular space. And they're applying this technology right now to prosthetic devices. There are many actual um, end uses, but they're focused right now on prosthetics. And you should just know, and may perhaps check it out, this is not just another prosthetic. The range of motion and sensitivity are unprecedented because of the fact that they're utilizing, they're uh, closing the loop and actually using feedback to adjust um, the ability and capability of uh, patients to um, uh, experience a type of range of motion that hasn't been experienced in the past. So they have had significant investment and media coverage in more than 10 countries. It's really um, getting a lot of buzz because it's such an incredibly uh, advanced technology in this space. Next, we have Stim Sherpa, which isn't a device, but instead it's a software as a service company that has been developing um, an optimization regime and algorithms um, to um, tune neurostimulators based on patient preference feedback. And their first application has been electrical stimulators that once were used for pain management and now have been applied adjacent to the spinal cord. And they've had tremendous results recovering muscle function in individuals with paraplegia. And so they're right now in the midst of a clinical trial and actually, so they treated individuals successfully, not just recent um, uh, patients who've had a traumatic uh, injury, uh, but those who've had um, and suffered for more than 30 years. So this video actually is one of those patients, long-term paraplegic, who after stimulation and then further optimization with um, Tay Nadoff's device are experience a range of motion that they haven't um, in the past. So this is one of those videos. Again, this individual, no movement uh, prior to this, and now walks with the aid of a walker. So I give you those examples, um, not because I'm, not only because I'm so proud of what they've been doing and the lives that they've changed because of their technology, but also um, as it relates to what we think is the future of healthcare, which is responsive therapy. And by responsive therapy, we mean a therapy that responds to the response of a patient to a particular treatment. 
So I showed you many examples of basically closed loop therapeutics. So you provide a stimulation and then you receive signals back from the body to let you know if you're hitting the target or not. And then you have immediate feedback to change the therapy. So I think this, we think this is the next really critical um, turning point. Before that, we've been developing and still are developing diagnostics via machine learning. So you have especially MRI imaging that's been used to um, better diagnose uh, patients so they get the right treatment. That was sort of first wave. Second wave is closed loop therapeutics, really enhancing the health index. And then at the top here, and one we're heading toward is maybe the ultimate responsive therapy, and that is regenerative medicine. So that is using uh, living cells or products of living cells to um, act as a therapeutic, and they themselves are responding to the patient's ecosystem and microenvironment. So that, that regenerative medicine piece is happening in the biomedical engineering department, certainly in my lab and others, um, other faculty. It's also happening in the Stem Cell Institute, which is my other hat that you heard about during the introduction. So the Stem Cell Institute was formed at about the same time actually as our department in 2020 or 2000 rather. And so we're celebrating our 20th anniversary and the whole goal was to see if we could better understand not how stem cells um, work during development, which is um, their native situation, uh, but how they function when taken outside of the body. And one of the biggest advancements in this space was the creation of a cell type called induced pluripotent stem cells. So right now I'm gonna ask Megan, just to get us kind of loosened up and, and uh, something fun in the middle of this presentation is, she's gonna put a poll up to see, I'd just be curious to know um, how many of you know what induced pluripotent stem cells are. If you could just enter in the chat, if you're willing, uh, we'll just keep it up for about 10 seconds. Um, again, it's induced pluripotent stem cells. If you've heard of them, uh, you know what they are, just check yes. Um, if not, no. I'll give you two more seconds. Okay, Megan, if you could share with us the results. All right, great. So um, most the 93% of you do not know what induced pluripotent stem cells is. So I'm happy to be able to share with you what they are because they are going to transform the future of medicine. And I want you all to know about this. So stem cells in general, the definition is a cell that can, it really only has two jobs. It doesn't really perform any direct function in the body. It's just a cell type that's able to either give rise to more stem cells, or it can be stimulated to become any cell type in the body. So it can become a neuron, it can become a liver cell, it can become a blood cell, it can become a muscle cell, um, all depending on the signals and cues that it receives from its local microenvironment. And that microenvironment can be in a culture dish or it can be in the body. And as I mentioned at the Stem Cell Institute, we're really trying to understand how this happens outside of the body, because the idea is if we could harness it, we could perhaps replace some of the damaged, dying or diseased cells in our bodies. So, so now I'm gonna tell you what induced pluripotent stem cells are. So pluripotent just means a stem cell type that can give rise to all of the cell types in the body with the exception of the placenta. Um, and in with development, those take the form of what you've heard of before, which are embryonic stem cells. They are pluripotent. But the discovery that really changed everything was the ability of us to take an adult cell. So it could be a skin cell, it could be a blood cell, any cell that you can take from the body and you can genetically reprogram it to become an induced pluripotent stem cell. And you do that by introducing new genes into the cell. Once you do that, it's called reprogramming. So it's kind of reverted to an earlier, younger state. And you can expand those, what we call them IPS cells. So induced pluripotent stem cells in a dish. And then what we're trying to do is figure out how to encourage them to become all the different cell types in the body. So this could be a really powerful, and has been a very powerful technology 
for two reasons. One, we can generate cell types that don't naturally regenerate in the body. And we can also make this um, a therapy that's customized to a particular individual and therefore avoid immune rejection um, from a, a different donor, for example, if you were receive um, organ uh, or transplanted cells or organs. So that's the potential of this technology. And I'll just give you a couple of brief examples of how um, that's being realized right now in the Stem Cell Institute um, and a little bit of my work in this space. Um, I'm gonna skip over Deb Farrington's work. Um, she's also trying to move toward uh, therapies for macular degeneration. You can look her up on our, our website to learn more information. I'll just highlight Bruce Walchek because his is the first IPS derived cell technology to be in actual clinical trials today. And it's the first IPS derived therapeutic in the nation, in the world uh, to be tested. So what he has done is to derive natural killer cells from IPS cells and has targeted them specifically to certain types of cancer. And so this whole protocol and the ramp up to manufacturing was done at the University of Minnesota. And now a company called Fate Therapeutics has taken that over and they're moving the clinical trial forward. So just to give you an idea that this, this 20 years of learning has now led to um, an, an, an actual clinical therapeutic. In my lab, we're trying to do the same thing, but in the cardiovascular space. So this beautiful cell here on the right is a cardiomyocyte. This is the muscle cell of the heart. It's the main work engine. It's what allows your heart to pump. The problem is these cells do not regenerate after injury or disease. So the most common injury or disease, um, cardiovascular disease is a heart attack. Um, and as you may know, once you have a heart attack, you lose cardiomyocytes that are distal to the point of occlusion of one of your coronary vessels. Once you lose those, cardiomyocytes don't come in to replace them. Instead, a different cell type called a fibroblast does, and it basically makes a big scar instead of a nice beating tissue. And what happens to that scar over time, you have this mechanical um, stimulation or assault the scar just gets bigger and your heart chambers dilate and eventually it leads to failure. So what we're trying to do is to generate cardiomyocytes in a dish, but also to organize them so that they might become a therapeutic. And in addition, we're trying to develop um, engineered cardiac tissues that can be used to study human disease in a dish. So the good news is that we know how to make cardiomyocytes in a dish. This is a video taken of um, cardiomyocytes that were derived from first a fibroblast taken from a living, living individual, reprogrammed to become an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then stimulated in a dish to become a beating cardiomyocyte. So that's a really significant technology uh, that's been developed. And what we're doing is using 3D printing to organize those cells. So I'm not going to go into all the details of how we do it today, but just you know, we can print uh, proteins at the scale with features of one micron um, in resolution. And so basically what we've done in each of these struts right here is one micron. And we basically put the cells on top of this patterned um, protein grid and in that way organize them to become a patch, in this case, a couple of millimeters, but we can make them up to a couple of centimeters. It's about 200 microns thick of cells that are arranged according to this grid and can be now synchronously. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so now we have organized muscul muscular tissue. This is a microscope image showing these are, each of those little dots is the nucleus of a cell that's basically sat down into this grid and it's nicely aligned. And what we can do for those electrical engineers out there is we can apply electrical stimulation to one side of the patch and it propagates the electromechanical signal across it can even increase the frequency of that electrical stimulation um, up to about four Hertz. So what you've got then is this beading patch in a dish, and we've now applied those to artificially imposed uh, infarcts in rodents. And basically what happens is that these patches couple on the healthy side to the cardiomyocytes and then couple on the other side and basically bypass 
the dead or damaged area. And we're applying these in large animals now as well. My last example is a model system that we're developing with the same concept. So we're using those cardiomyocytes we can generate in a dish. And in this case, we're using protein structures and bio inks to support a chambered pump like structure. So this is us 3D printing a pump like structure that contains, um, in this case, stem cells. So we take proteins, we mix it with stem cells, we make a structure that looks like a heart, basically has chambers and can be perfused. We culture it in a dish, expand the stem cells, and then we transform those stem cells into cardiomyocytes and you get a beading structure that looks like this. This video just shows the fact that it can be perfused so you can have fluid in, like blood, blood in, blood out. It beats synchronously and this is at the scale right now of a centimeter, centimeter and a half. So this is not the scale of a human heart. This is the scale of a rodent heart, um, but it's really the, the biggest advance in this field to date. You can also look at voltage sensitive dyes and how they propagate across this structure. So we really have contiguous muscle function that again can be paced and you can see that dramatic pumping activity. So we want to use this, as I mentioned, as a model system. You can imagine this is the only human model of its kind. This is where we'll find out what a human will do in response to, for example, a drug treatment. So we can put in a pressure transducer and conductance catheter into this structure and measure pressure volume dynamics in the spontaneous case and get a quasi pressure volume loop. So this is a clinically analogous metric. Then we can treat it with something like isoproteranol, which should increase the heart rate. We even know what this does. Then you can see the corresponding change in the, the um, pressure volume dynamics. And so we want to use this for other therapies that are de being developed for the heart or drugs for some other organ system because we might be worried about cardiotoxicity. We can also use them as disease models. So we are right now developing a model of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We've generated IPS lines from individuals with disease or that have mutations that we know correspond to HCM. And then we can make this chambered muscle pump and look and better study how the disease evolves and progresses. And then of course, one day we hope we can use it as a therapeutic, perhaps a living pump to replace a damaged or failing uh, pump. So that was a lot. I know it went, went by quickly. I hope it piqued some of your interest and you wanna learn more. I bring us back to this responsive therapy continuum. Um, my son and I met Jesse Jackson last summer and he said, if you wanna make a point, you've gotta repeat it. So here's my repeat of our story and our vision for the future. I told you a lot about some of the closed loop therapeutics and biomedical engineering, and then some of the regenerative medicine work that we're doing um, in the Stem Cell Institute and really across the university. Um, our hope is that um, we can be leaders in this space at the University of Minnesota and, and push this new concept right now all of it's happening you know, between colleges across the university and in collaboration with local industry. And we, what we'd like to move to is to establish or develop an accessible innovation space for, to help build and grow this responsive medicine concept. At the same time, we're trying to foster the development of trailblazers, um, our trainees who will define new paths and, and take us forward beyond responsive medicine. And then of course, we wanna recognize the achievements of you all, um, our alumni, to deepen those connections and really make progress for um, our field and for society. So with that, thank you very much for listening. I meant to tell you at the very beginning, if you have questions, you can add them to the chat. You can add them to the chat right now if you haven't already. Um, and I think, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but we may have a, a minute. I think we'll only have time for a question or two. Um, I did want to ask you uh, how the how students in your department or other departments across the college or university are involved in the research happening in your department or in the stem cell institute. Right. So we want to have engagement of as many students as possible, especially for our undergrads. 
you know, I, I think and I hope that the reason they went to the University of Minnesota is excellent uh, didactic training, but access to the laboratories. So most labs have direct pairing of a more senior student, graduate student or postdoc or a research scientist with an undergraduate um, student. So they uh, receive training that way. They also receive training through um, co-ops and internships um, on oftentimes collaborative projects between our research labs and the company that they're working with. Great, thank you. And one more question that came in through the chat. Does this new technology you discussed eliminate the need to obtain fetal stem cells? It does. It does. That's one of the big boons of this technology is uh, easy access and eliminates um, some of the discussion and uh, moral uh, challenges that come into play as we think about using embryonic stem cells. That was our first exposure to the, the power of a pluripotent stem cell. And now with induced pluripotent stem cells, added bonus of also being able to generate them for an individual might need the therapy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think that's all we have time for today, but we appreciate you giving so much of your time and sharing this amazing work that you and your colleagues are doing. It's really inspiring. And uh, I know we all will look forward to hearing more about all the developments to come. Uh, so please everyone join me in giving a silent thank you uh, over the airwaves to Professor Ogle. And thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Ogle. Uh, and you. just a little, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So I'm now going to turn things over to my colleague, Kim Doctor, for the Golden Medallion Society uh, induction ceremony. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Joelle said, my name is Kim Doctor. I'm the Assistant Dean for External Relations for the College of Science and Engineering, or IT, as you remember it. Um, thank you so much for joining us and your fellow classmates today. It, I was browsing the attendee list, and I know a lot of you, and I look forward to meeting those that I don't know next year at Golden Medallion Re and Reunion. Um, I'm so pleased to, to welcome you. The Golden Medallion Society includes all alumni who have graduated 50 or more years ago from the college. Each year, we welcome the class celebrating its 50th reunion into the society. Given that we were not able to celebrate last year, we're welcoming both the classes of 1970 and 1971 this year. As we reflect upon your incredible achievements and experiences over the past 50 years, I'm reminded that the CSE graduating class of 2021 is just about to embark on their adventures and just think of how much they have to look forward to and the amazing contributions they, like you, will make to society. To honor the milestone of their 50th reunion, um, the, the class of 1958, led by Jean McCollum, who's with us today, by the way, uh, created a scholarship called the Golden Medallion Society Scholarship. All are welcome to support this scholarship fund, which has grown to 250,000, that, that includes the president's match, but it's, a, it's become a large scholarship and it's just a wonderful thing. Um, we'll be sending out an email following reunion that explains how to give to this scholarship if you'd like to. Um, currently, the Golden Medallion Scholarship has three scholarship recipients and I am so pleased to be able to introduce them to you now. Hi, I'm Clayton Johnson. I'm a junior and I'm majoring in computer science. Hi, uh, my name is Howie Peterson. Um, I am a freshman this year. Um, I am currently enrolled in the College of Science and Engineering, but I do have plans to transfer to Carlson to major in entrepreneurial management. Hi, my name is Katana Devanvong and I'm a third year student here at the U studying computer engineering. So I work for the space physics program, which is Space physics is physics in the solar system, not outside of the solar system. So most of space physics revolves around uh, the sun and the plasma that comes from the sun and towards the earth. They showed me a program that they had partly finished to, um, well, it's pretty complicated, but it, it, uh, 
it groups currents, I guess, it groups electric currents that come in around the Earth, and that's those electric currents are what causes the aurora. And after I was able to figure out kind of how it worked, my boss told me, um, kind of worked with me and told me what he wanted the program to do so I could finish it, and that's what I'm working on right now. And I was able to, you know, secure an internship for my first year, second year, and now third year. I just accepted an offer um, at Medtronic in their software group, so pretty excited about that. I'm still not sure exactly where in computer science I want to go, um, but a couple of ideas are because of my physics background, um, I can do scientific programming for like a research institution. Like right now, I work for the physics department and I do programming for them. And if I could keep working for a department at a university or if I could go work at some uh, some research facility like NASA or something like that, that would be fun. Um, also, I think my slight background in physics uh, would put me in a good position to go into computer animation because I can understand how light works and how um, and how that would work in a program, I guess. I'd like to take over my dad's business and grow that to a larger industry with many employees, um, many projects going at the same time. I'd love to manage and operate those and make sure everything is going smoothly um, and just have like a large scale operation to build. My career goals include being able to participate in the development of a medical device that, not to sound cheesy, ultimately like changes the world and helps people. People, so. One of the biggest things with uh, getting scholarship support is it just gives me, it gives me like a lot more freedom in, in navigating being a student right now and um, like for instance the job that I have right now it doesn't pay very well and it's it's really good for experience and putting on a resume and you know maybe if I didn't get scholarship help then I wouldn't have the freedom to take such a job where I don't get paid a whole lot. My original plan was to go to community college um, and hopefully run through a program there. Yeah, and I'm just thankful that I received the scholarships that I did so that I could be here to experience all of this. Thank you very much. Well, I'm a first generation student and I'm also the oldest in my family. So I'm the first to leave the nest and funding college was a big stressor growing up, um, not just for me, but for my family. And so to be awarded this scholarship means the world to both me and my family and like the financial security really, really helps me in terms of just, you know, focusing on school and applying all my energy into my studies versus, you know, having to take up a part-time job. So I'm extremely grateful for the scholarship. Thank you so much for the generous scholarship. You know, I really appreciate it. And so does my family. <laughs>
just so happy to have you all. Members of the class of 1971, um, will you please turn your videos on? All right. On behalf of the College of Science and Engineering and the University of Minnesota, it is my pleasure to welcome the class of 1971 to the Golden Medallion Society. I formally congratulate you on this momentous milestone. If you haven't already done so, please place your medallion around your neck. And again, bravo and congratulations. I like you. I like your pom-pom, Joelle, that's great. <laughs> All right, um, class of 1971, if you would please turn your videos off now. Um, each year we have members of the Golden Medallion Society who have not been to a previous reunion. Their names are now on the screen. Um, again, those who are registered for this event. So these are people who graduated um, more than 50 years ago who just haven't had a chance to get back to reunion and we're so happy to have you here now. Um, first time attendees uh, from the Golden Medallion Society are now welcome to turn their videos on. On behalf of the College of Science and Engineering and the University of Minnesota, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Golden Medallion Society and to formally congratulate you on this momentous milestone. If you've not already done so, please place your medallions around your neck. Congratulations, bravo. Um, Golden Medallion Society members, you may now turn your videos off. Um, I just, again, want to congratulate you all and thank you for joining us for this very special occasion. Next year, I really hope we can be in person. Actually, I'm pretty confident we will be able to, and I'll be able to shake your hands and help you get those medallions around your neck. So congratulations and thanks so much for joining us. Let me add my congratulations. I think I missed the class of 1970 with my pom-pom. I was a little slow on my video. So a pom-pom for you guys too. Um, so this is bringing us to the end of our official reunion program. And in a moment, we'll send anyone who would like to stay for the breakout room portion of the event to do so. And <laughs> if you're not interested, you can uh, sign off. Uh, please mute yourself if you're uh, unmuted right now. Um, so we'd like to thank you all, as Kim said, for attending this experiment, this virtual reunion event. Uh, we weren't sure when we started planning it with the class of 1971 committee, 70 and 71 committee, if there'd be interest. And we're so delighted that so many of you wanted to join us today. We know it does not replace coming to campus and seeing everyone in person. But as Kim said, uh, we hope to be back in person next year. And we hope that in the meantime, you enjoyed being able to mark your graduation in this way uh, and to gather together with us and with members of a variety of classes from across the country. And I think we even had a Canadian person sign up today. Um, so to mark the momentous occasion of, of your graduation 50 or more years ago. Uh, and as a reminder, we'll send a follow-up email in a couple of weeks. It'll have a link to the recording of this presentation, as well as a link to the Golden Medallion scholarship information that Kim mentioned uh, and some other information and resources for you as well. Uh, so as you'll see, we have a slide up with the lyrics to the Minnesota Rouser. Uh, every time we gather in person for the reunion celebration, we always end with a communal singing of the Minnesota Rouser. It's really weird to sing over Zoom together, but we felt like the event would not be complete if we didn't include this. Uh, so we're all going to give it a try. Bear with us. Uh, I'm sure my singing voice will not be uh, quite as, as glorious as what you remember from years past singing in the stadium. Um, but we're going to play, uh, hopefully, if it all works as according to plan, a recording of the Minnesota Rouser being played by the marching band. Uh, and we invite you all to join me and my colleagues and sing along with the Rouser. So go ahead and cue us up.
Well, as you can see, it doesn't sound quite as nice as when we sing it all together in person, but it is a festive way to cap off uh, this reunion, virtual reunion event. So um, if you don't wish to stay for the breakout portions, that's the end of the formal program and you're welcome to leave the meeting. If you're leaving now, uh, thank you so much for coming and we look forward to hopefully seeing you back on campus next May, 2022 at our next reunion. 